Amen. Luke chapter 9 and verse 37 is where I'll start to read. I, I feel some, some direction from the Lord to look at, at this passage, and uh, there's, there's a lot that's covered in, in these short verses in the context here. Before we get into this, let me um, just ask you, may, maybe you have, uh, when you were a child, you played the game that we call the telephone game. Anybody remember that? Where you would get in a circle or a line and you would say something into somebody's ear, yeah. then they would turn it and say it to the next person and so forth and so forth. The idea was you come out with the same message that you started with, right? But the game often proved that just because one person said something to somebody, that doesn't mean it was heard the way it was said, and it definitely doesn't mean it was repeated the same way that it was first heard. And then as it goes down the line, what was the original message kind of gets changed. Sometimes it gets lost in translation. Sometimes it gets, it gets confused, and I, I think the word was this or that. Now, um, Keep that in mind, and then as we look in the Gospels today, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this, this passage that we're going to just quickly look at, the three gentlemen were there, Matthew was there, Mark was there, and Luke was there when this occurred, and then the Holy Ghost inspired them to write down what happened in this event. Everybody say the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost inspired Matthew to write the way Matthew wrote and Mark and Luke. Now, I don't believe that the Holy Ghost is just saying as if you weren't even there. The Holy Ghost, the scripture says that it brings things to our remembrance, right? So they, I, I, I don't think that they carry clipboards with them. And as things were happening, it is, well, it was a hot day in August. No, they go back after the fact and record from memory and with the help of the Holy Ghost, they're recording what happened. And you've seen this, I'm sure, by now many times in Scripture. The same recording in the Gospels is either written slightly differently or worded a little bit differently, or sometimes what even happens is we don't see it across Matthew and Mark and Luke or even John. For example, the story we're going to look at today, this account, is not in the book of John. Does, does that mean John wasn't there? No, it just means the Holy Ghost inspired these three men to share this story. And as we look at it, you'll see the perspective. Now, let me point out just a couple of things quickly. Luke, uh, I believe it's Colossians, Paul refers to Luke, our beloved Luke, the, the physician. Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. That doesn't mean he wasn't invited, and that doesn't mean he wasn't around. He recorded these things still, and he also is the author with the Holy Ghost of the book of Acts. So he was there. He did see and witness a lot of things. But oftentimes, like we'll see in this story, after something happens, Jesus will gather the 12 to himself. Luke is not one of those 12. Sometimes the Holy Ghost or the word got out, or maybe Luke overheard and he would record some things that Jesus spoke to the disciples. Other times, we see that in Matthew or Mark or John, but not necessarily Luke. So I, I, I'm intentionally choosing Luke's recording of this um, account because it's the shortest. Everybody say, thank you, Elder. Thank you. We're going to read the shortest of these, and then I'll just tell you about what the other ones say. All right? So Luke chapter 9, verse 37, it says, And it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. Or let me correct that and say many people. The English teachers say, thank you, Elder. <laughs> many people, much people met him. So it was a crowd of people. 
And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. There's a gathering, and the other, the other recordings make it even more clear. It's almost like a commotion that's taking place, and the crowd is gathering. And then Jesus and his, some of his followers happen upon it. Some of his other disciples were already there. And they see what's taking place, and this father of a, of a child says, Master, look upon my son, my only child. Now, just a side note, for example, Luke's the only one that records that this is his only child. Matthew and Mark just say, my son. There might be significance there. It depends on what the Holy Ghost tells you about it. From my perspective, I see Luke is saying, that's how desperate this man is. His only son. Now, keep reading. And lo, a spirit taketh him. Everybody say a spirit. A spirit takes him, and, sudden, and he suddenly crieth out. So my boy is acting up, but it's not just misbehaving. There's something going on here of a spiritual nature. And Lord, I need your help with this. He suddenly cries out, and the spirit teareth him that he foameth again, and bruising him hardly, departeth from him. This is, this, my, my boy is in bad shape. He's dealing with some things, some spiritual things, and I've tried, others have tried. We don't know how to help him, but we see that he needs help. Keep going, verse 40. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. Audible gasp. No, I'm just kidding. That's, oh, what? The disciples? They couldn't cast out this spirit? Keep going, verse 41. And Jesus answering said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither, verse 42. And as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down. And tear him. Some of the other passages say, as they were coming to Jesus and the Spirit saw Jesus, then it started acting this way. Throws him down, tear him, and Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child. Everybody say healed. healed. It struck me as significant that Luke, the physician, wrote that Jesus healed the child. Now, I apologize if this sounds like a mishmash today because it's all over the place and there's, like I said, three different recordings and details in all three that aren't in all the other three. But we see here, Jesus rebuked the devil, called out the unclean spirit, and it says he healed the child and delivered him again to his father. Now, side note, healed. When it, and cured. The previous verse says, I brought him to your disciples. He couldn't, they couldn't cure him. They couldn't cast out the spirit, but greater, they couldn't cure him. Just out of curiosity, I went in to look at what that word cure means. There is a Greek word that will sound very familiar. I don't remember, remember the exact, but I can tell you it was something like Therapeutico. That's butchering it, I apologize. But you get the root word behind that, right? They couldn't thera therapeutico him. They couldn't give him the proper therapy to cure him. Now, that's not what this message is about today. But while we're here, let's just put it in neutral for a second and think about the cure. Think about the cure, the healing. I, I, I am not against therapy at all. In fact, there are cures, there are healings that take place 
outside of the church building. I know that sounds crazy, but it happens. And oftentimes it is a person needs the therapy that comes from sitting down and discussing with understanding what's taking place. I said sometimes, okay? That's what's needed, and that's what's helpful. In this passage, the father is saying, my son has tried therapy, if I can put it that way. My son has tried other ministers praying for him or helping him, meaning your disciples. And this spirit is just not being cast out. We're not getting the cure. We're not getting the help that we're seeking here. So Jesus, again, he looks at the boy and speaks to the spirit, calls him out. Now, just quickly, if you'll let me, Mark... Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 17. I'm not going to read the entire account again, but I'm going to let you see some of the highlights as Matthew and Mark record these. So Matthew 17, verse 15. Watch what the, the Father says to Jesus. Matthew 17, 15. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic. And sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. Now I have scrolled through here, and if I missed it, I apologize, you can look at it yourself. But nowhere in the recording of Matthew does the Father address this as a spiritual problem. It's a, there's clearly a problem, but he, unlike in Luke and in Mark, they record that basically the father says, my son has an evil spirit. Matthew says, my son is lunatic. That's not demon possessed. Those, those words don't mean the same thing. Lunatic really means he acts out at night or the moon is somehow causing him to go insane. And sore vexed. So I know he's got problems, but I don't know what they are. The reason why I'm pausing to point this out is because <laughs> some of you grew up in houses where everything that went wrong was the devil. Some of you never heard that. And when you hear other people say it, you kind of look at them sideways like, really? Is that the devil or is that because you didn't brush your teeth? No, I'm just saying. Uh, sorry. That's a cheap shot. That's a cheap shot, and I apologize. But the point is, you get to a place, and you don't know what's causing the problem. And whether you've got it diagnosed or not, Jesus is the answer. Whether you can, Because in Mark, the father brings him right to him and says, he's got a dumb spirit. There is an evil spirit that's causing him not to talk. So, all even across this room, with our very degrees and understanding of what's spiritual in nature and what is flesh in nature, the answer is still Jesus. The, the, the cure, the therapy that you need is Jesus. Let him give that direction. Let him address the problem. So here, let's just read it real, real quick. He's lunatic, sore vexed. Oft times he falleth. Oh, he's just clumsy. My, my son is just clumsy, Lord. But if you could help him, you know, straighten his feet out a little bit, give him some coordination, and we'll lay hands on him, and we'll, he'll be coordinated. I don't know what he needs, right? It's almost like two different parents talking here, right? When this one, the account says... He, he, he just struggles, and, and he falls into the fire. He falls into the water. Keep going. Verse 16, I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not therapeutico him. There it is again. They could not cure him. They couldn't teach him hand-eye coordination. They couldn't teach him how to speak correctly. I don't know what to do. 
I, I, I'm intentionally pausing and backing up a little bit to make sure we don't leave anybody behind because some people might not know yet what their problem is. They just realize there's an issue and it's not changing, it's not getting better. I'm not trying to convince you here that you've got an evil spirit, okay? Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm, what I'm saying. What I am trying to convince you is whatever the problem is, Jesus is the answer. Thy disciples could not cure. In verse 17, Jesus said, O faithless and perverse generation. That sounds the same. And then he says, bring him hither to me. Next verse 18. Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. That's the recording according to Matthew. Mark 9. Seventeen. I just referenced this, but I want you to see it in Scripture. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Now, jump down to verse 21, because this is the only recording that we see this interaction in the story. Jesus says... How long has he been this way? I don't know if Mark and Luke didn't hear him say that or if the Holy Ghost only intentionally inspired uh, Matthew, only intentionally inspired Mark to record it this way. But this interaction is significant because it proves Jesus cares more than just, let's get all the evil spirits out of here so I can go have lunch. No, no. He cares about the individual, the family, how long it's been going on. What did he say to the, to the man at the pool of Bethesda? How long have you been this way since I was a child? Right? Jesus cares. He, he wants to know. He already knows, but he wants to know and wants you to know that he cares about your situation. So he says, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said of a child. Now let me pause and again clarify another thing here. This is not demon casting out 101. Okay? I don't want anybody to think that's the purpose of this today. There is no demon casting 101 because you go to the Bible and you see it done many different ways. Even recorded many different ways in this one passage. All right? So don't get off track and don't think well that that's what we're supposed to learn here today again Jesus is the answer is what we're supposed to learn here today so he says of a child this has been going on since he was a child Maybe you've heard this term before, harmony of the Gospels. Really, that's what we're examining. That's what we're looking at today is the Gospels share the same stories, but they say it very differently sometimes. Again, Luke said the, the words of the Father are, a spirit taketh him. Matthew said he is a lunatic and sore vexed. Mark said he has a dumb spirit. In each one of those, what you can boil it down to, Jesus' action that he takes place is rebuking the unclean spirit, healing the child, rebuking the devil, and even in one passage, speaking to the devil, saying, thou dumb and deaf spirit. Luke, I see, was written from the perspective of the onlookers. I told you I was reading the shortest one. It's brief in its nature compared to what you read in Matthew and Mark. But again, it's written from the perspective of the crowd. I told you there was a crowd there that day. So what Luke heard, saw, and recorded was if you weren't a disciple but you were there, what basically it would have been your takeaway, what's, what happened there. Matthew and Mark 
have a slightly different perspective. Matthew focuses on the disciples and what happens from their perspective. Now, I'm going to skip ahead just a bit because you realize, like I do, and I read it in one of them, Jesus cast out the devil and healed the young man. Now, verse 20 in Matthew 17. Verse 19, let's just go back to verse 19. The disciples came to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? Luke doesn't even record this part, okay? This little powwow after between Jesus and the disciples. You don't see that anywhere in Luke, but you see it in Matthew and in Mark. Matthew, the disciples come to him and say, tell us what we did wrong, basically, why couldn't we do this? I mean, we've, we've had our experiences. In another passage, it says they, they came back to Jesus and reported, the demons are subject to us. So, Lord, I thought we had power over unclean spirits. Why couldn't we cast him out? Next verse. Very plainly, Jesus says, because of your unbelief. Now, imagine... Jesus looking into the faces of his closest followers and saying, the problem is your unbelief. You didn't think it could happen. A lack of faith. That's your unbelief. Verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed. Now, pause for a second. Let me, let, let's just get, get into this here real quick. You've probably heard this before. I doubt I'm sharing much new information with anybody today. But you've heard before about the mustard seed and how small it is, right? Jesus says, if you have faith, that's the size of the smallest, tiniest little mustard seed. Then you can say to a mountain, be thou removed, cast into the sea, and it will happen. Now, in other instances... They, they said the demons are subject to us. So what I see here is Jesus saying at this moment in time, in this circumstance, you didn't have the same faith that you had in the other circumstance. I, if I can put it this way, I, I, don't put this on the recording. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> what I see here is faith is fluid. It's not like Wow, Jesus did an awesome miracle, so from now on, everybody get out of my way. Because every step I take, another miracle, another miracle, another. No, you had faith that matched the, the will of God in that situation, and the miracle happened. But then, Jesus says, in this instance, it, the reason why, the only reason why it didn't happen is because of your unbelief. Now, he diagnoses how the unbelief gets there if we keep reading. Oh, let's go back to verse 20. There's a very, very powerful and important phrase there at the end. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Essentially, what he's saying is, if you have faith, mustard seed sized faith, nothing shall be impossible to you. So whenever something's seemingly impossible or you know it's the will of God and you're praying it and it's not happening, go back to this passage and look at it again. Next verse, 21. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. What does he mean when he says this kind? Well, what went out? Howbeit. This kind goeth not out. He cast out an unclean spirit. And it went out at his word, at his command. And now he's saying to the disciples, it went out. This kind goeth not out, but by prayer 
and fasting. Now, you've probably heard me say this. Some of you have before. Just Jesus didn't call a prayer and fasting meeting when the father approached him, right? And say, well, oh, oh I've diagnosed the problem. It's this dumb and deaf spirit. The only way to cast it out is prayer and fasting. So we're going to take three days, pray and fast, and then we're going to come back and combat this spirit. No, Jesus was a man who practiced prayer and fasting regularly. It doesn't say in there, and he had not eaten for 40 days. It doesn't say in there, and he just came from a place of prayer. So what we recognize is he had a life of discipline and prayer. Fasting is discipline. Okay? He had a life of discipline and prayer, and that's why he was able to speak in that moment to that spirit, and that spirit had to obey him. I love the disciples. Sometimes I'm guilty of probably putting them on a pedestal. But an instance like this shows us they are human. We don't know, again, the last time they prayed or fasted, according to our understanding of prayer and fasting. But what Jesus is saying is, if you had been praying and fasting correctly, you would have had the faith to address this thing. But since the faith is not there, I can examine the prayer and the fasting and see that that's why the faith is not there. I, if you want to wreck your walk with the Lord, just start being undisciplined. I'm not saying go out and commit all kinds of terrible crimes and sins and all that. I'm just saying start being undisciplined. Don't think about what's right and wrong and what time you ought to go to bed or get up in the morning. Don't worry about being half a day late for work. Don't, don't worry about, you know, not making meals for the family. Just, just, just go without discipline. You want to see what will happen. All kinds of evil will start raising its head around there because it knows there's no discipline here. And I'm allowed to fester. That spirit is allowed to make home and it can, because it knows it can't just be spoken to and cast out. Because this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now, i got to keep going. I'm almost done. That's the perspective of the disciples. Go back to Mark. Mark 22. We, we read this one, but just so you see it again and where we're at. So in 21, he asks the father, how long has he been like this? He says, of a child, oft times he casts himself into the fire. Mark 9, 22, and into the water. But thou, the father says, but if thou canst do anything. Nobody else can do anything. He's not getting better. Lord, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I'm sure, like me, you have recognized that feeling before. Nothing else is working. I've tried this. I've tried that. We've gone here. We've done this. Nothing is working. Lord, it's not wrong to pray this way, okay? Sometimes you get to this point in prayer. I don't know what else to do, Lord. If you can do anything about it, I know you can, Lord. But my faith in expression in this prayer is if, if you can do anything about it. 
Have compassion on us and help us. Verse 23, Jesus says to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now, that's a recap of what he said to the disciples about the mustard seed and the faith and speaking to the mountain and all those things. He says virtually the same thing to the Father. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Verse 24, you can stand with me. Verse 24. We see one of the most honest recordings of a human in dialogue with Jesus in this verse right here. Because the problem is presented to the Lord. The appeal for help is given to the Lord. The answer is given by the Lord. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. In verse 25, or verse 24, right there. Straightway the father of the child cried out. And said with tears. Mm, mm, mm. Let me paraphrase this. Lord, if. I'm the problem. If the problem is with me and my belief or lack of belief, I'm coming back to you again with very specific requests saying, help my unbelief. We won't overlook what he said to the disciples. That's why we spent the time there, the prayer and the fasting, the discipline. In fact, in my time of walking with the Lord in my observation, you will get to the place where the Lord tests your discipline. Lack of discipline is the biggest enemy to faith. I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way before, but faith, the, the first time you approach God, or maybe a small need, or it's easy to have faith over that, and you just speak it, and if it happens, great. Way to go, God. But when you get into a developed walk with the Lord and a mature relationship with the Lord... You're going to come across situations and you pray a prayer of faith and you don't see the result of the thing that you just prayed about. What is the solution? We see in the discussion with the disciples, Jesus said, this happens through prayer and fasting. If you're waiting on me or Elder Hart to ask you to fast, pray about that. There will be times that we do, but that ought not be the only time we ever fast. Why? Because what did I say? Fasting is discipline. Fasting is not not eating. Fasting is not not scrolling through social media. Fasting is discipline. And with a life of discipline, all things are possible. I'm going to give you one more word of instruction. Verse 25 of Mark. When Jesus saw, because this is one of these that's only in Mark. When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, 
saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him. Watch this. This is not recorded in every passage where we see demons cast out. But it's in this passage, and it's significant. Come out and enter no more into him. Our lives should not be <laughs> is the unclean there today or is it not there today is the evil allowed to operate today or is it not allowed to operate today no with the help of the Lord we pray it this way and we pray shut that door and let it not ever be opened again I'm going to give us an opportunity to pray and respond. I, I, I feel like with all that's being said today, the Lord is speaking to, to many of us about specific situations in our life. Maybe you've got a need and you've yet to see the answer for that need. The answer is Jesus. Maybe you've been wondering, Lord, is it my faith? Am I the problem? Is, what's the issue? The issue is discipline, prayer and fasting. Would you find a place to pray right now? I also believe the Lord's going to take some of you into intercession with this knowledge and praying about other situations, praying for others with this understanding that with all with, with God all things are possible to him that believeth all things are possible come on this altar is open would you find a place and pray right now let's let the Lord order and direct our prayers here for a moment